Greetings. I'm Dr. Sudhir Prabhu, a founding member of STARS Forum. A warm welcome to all of you on behalf of STARS Forum as we begin our 11th annual conference. Normally, STARS Forum holds a three days in-person annual event. But this year, obviously, we have had to improvise. The virtual format effectively has allowed speakers and attendees to participate from across India and also internationally. I bring you warm greetings from the United States. So it's good evening to most of you, good afternoon to those from Europe and good morning to the attendees from the US. The conference is spread over the next five days from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. India time. Each day is devoted to a different relevant subject of practical importance to socioeconomic development of the disadvantaged rural populations. The objective this year is to highlight innovative approaches, showcase promising models, underscore the role of technology, and share success stories in rural transformation to help us all better understand and navigate the challenges of our field that our field is facing during the current pandemic crisis and is very likely to be confronting in the post COVID period as well. Since many in the attendance today may not be very familiar with STARS Forum, please allow me to introduce the organization very briefly. So what I'll do is I'm going to share my screen and uh, go over a couple of things. STARS uh, is an acronym for Skills Training Advancement in Rural Societies. It's a nodal organization. Its mission is to be a collaborative body for mutual support of those, all of all those engaged in, whether individuals or NGOs, engaged in vocational skills, knowledge-based and entrepreneurship-driven development of rural communities, facilitate advances in this field and promote innovative approaches to reach larger disadvantaged populations. Broadly then, this translates into several defined objectives. To serve as a platform a catalyst for networking and knowledge dissemination, for collaborations and partnerships at many levels with affiliate um, nonprofits and individuals working in this field, to help advance innovations and the use of technology so that we can reach larger numbers of people as effectively as possible, to assist affiliate member organizations enhance effectiveness and their capacity, empowering them to nurture future leaders and advocate for, for policies to advance our sector and essentially the impact we want to make to, our, to the population that we are serving. STAR utilizes various means to advance these objectives, including our website, the social media, workshops, conferences, distant learning modules, such as webinars and YouTube, and actively connects organizations and collaborations uh, for collaboration, partnership and capacity building. Affiliate membership. We invite and request you to become an affiliate member of STARS to participate and take full advantage of its collaborative structure for mutual benefit. There is no fee, just your consent. If your organization is not a member already, you will receive an email with an invitation and details. We look forward to your joining the STARS family of like-minded organizations all over India and all over the world. Please free to contact us. We invite you to visit our website and access our YouTube channel for conference presentations and webinar recordings. Some housekeeping tips. Please type any questions you may have in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. The raise hand feature will not be active. Please use the Q&A box. We will keep up, we'll take up questions after the last presentation and try to cover as many as possible. If any remain unanswered due to time constraints, we will make sure that the answers reach you on email after screening. 
after the meeting. I'm going to stop my uh, screen share. Let us proceed with the inaugural address. I'm most delighted that to introduce our distinguished speaker, Padma Shri, Dr. Shama Metre, or Shama Didi, as she is known to us fondly. She is the founder and national director of CORD, or Chinmay Organization for Rural Development. CORD was initiated in Siddhibadi in Himachal Pradesh and currently covers over 900 villages, including in Orissa, Tamil Nadu, and Andhra Pradesh. Dr. Metre left a flourishing pediatrics practice in New Delhi to work in the rural healthcare services after being inspired by the world-renowned Swami Chinmayananda. She immersed herself in rural development work in Siddhi in 1985, and over the years has made monumental contributions in the rural social health and economic development fields with her tireless and dedicated service. She's recognized for her contributions internationally and nationally, including the Padma Shri in 2008. Shama Didi also is a founding member of STARS Forum and has actively supported the forum's mission since its earliest days. Dr. Shama Metre, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prabhu. It is wonderful to be back with Stars Forum and to and uh, hurry home to my panelist, Priya Shah and Sumita Ghoshetu and all the participants. It gives me great pleasure to inaugurate the 11th annual conference of the Stars Forum and it gives me great pride too, since I've been associated with the Stars Forum for many past years. The topic is about livelihood and skills in the post-pandemic period. I would be talking generally about what the pandemic has been to all of us. It has disrupted lives all over the world. The lockdown especially hit many lives. For us in India, different regions had disproportionate types of responses, reactions and sufferings. Depending on the kind of unemployment, the resources at that site, and the sector that was involved. The most hit were the migrant laborers. And it made the, actually the pandemic has made visible how the uh, our laborers, our migrant laborers, the extent of their poverty and the extent of their vulnerability has become visible to all. It was very sad to see that they had to, during the lockdown, struggle to go back to their homes because they did not have a roof over their heads or were actually affected by hunger. The, thing was that when they back, went back to their villages, they had their identities, the social security identity too. They were able to access their ration cards and livelihood in their life to some extent was extended by the rural development. So it is difficult to not be able to understand what kind of shift the balance of uh, the, uh, the kind of, you know, the balance that we saw, the shift of balance we saw by COVID-19 that revealed that urban India, although important, need not be the sole area for job opportunities and livelihood. The GDP, 
the farm sector was the only one that showed the growth at 3.4%. India's GDP fell down drastically during the lockdown period, contracted down to 23.9%. In the second quarter, that is after July to September, it showed still this the GDP is still quite dismal, but certain improvements have been there and not so bad with a 7.5% contraction in GDP. But what was most important is that rural India emerged as the savior of Indian economy. However, this rural surge that is sometimes referred to as the green shoots was driven by a lot of rural development schemes, cash transfer to the poor, free rations, subsidized rations, a lot of other schemes that came up, Mandrega, et cetera. But all the points drove home to all of us that India must realize that we need to build a more robust and resilient villages and the country move towards more holistic growth in rural India. There are certain positive stories to tell in rural India. One of the things was that the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme showed a paradigm shift in building livelihood assets for individual villagers. Besides the collective community livelihood assets being built with watershed, the usual watershed and ponds, but the fact that they looked at each of the village, villagers who demanded their jobs and have helped them to build their livelihood assets will go a long time to change her out of their economic status. Another very big positive shift that all of us who work in rural India saw was that a big leap occurred in digital learning. Even women, simple village women, some illiterate learned the fact how to communicate with us, connect with us for training and their communication skills improved even what we saw was persons with disabilities were able to build up their own skill in this area. But nevertheless, we need to do whatever it takes to rejuvenate growth and support livelihood and skill development all over the country and all the three main sectors, farm and allied, the agriculture sector, the service sector, and the manufacturing sector. One of the other things that I think COVID pandemic has brought out to us is that we cannot anymore look down at climate change and the way it's going to hurl down onto the whole planet. USA saw what happens when you see, take economics above all other things, even human lives. So certain other growths will take place, hopefully in renewable energy. Solar energy would be a good idea for India to develop it for its farm irrigation, processes of storing and, um, you know, post harvest, uh, management. A lot of innovative approaches have to be created. One has to begin to assess and analyze what is the situation now? What, what are the stents that we have? What is the kind of way ahead 
and forward we want to build. What are the resources available to us? What are the kind of resources that we will need? And the kind of changes that we would need in our livelihood sectors in different areas and at different levels of people's growth. Whenever I think of India, I would like to think about our richness in diversity and the richness of India in many other fields. These need to be leveraged. Model for India is in India. India has poverty, but India is not poor. India has illiterates and semi-illiterates, but they are not without knowledge and wisdom and insights. One needs to explore different strategies in different contexts. One size does not fit all. There are no magic bullets. Local solutions to local issues need to be leveraged. Both traditional and non-traditional ways of earning can be fostered with modern knowledge, skill upgradation, using technology wherever required and digital media when required. What I want to emphasize is that we have to become more people-centric and India-centric to create jobs, livelihoods, which will then offer many more opportunities. We need to have the concept of weaving development around people and not people around development. The key lies in participatory development, management, and control in most instances. Now, let us look at the different kinds of jobs at different levels that one sees when working mostly and primarily in rural India. For the marginalized farmers and small farmers, to move from sustenance to sustainable livelihood, one needs multi-pronged approach. That means to upgrade their skills and their productivity and marketing and farm and allied sector, as well as the non-farm sector. Our experience over the years have shown that this kind of model not only takes the family into better lifestyles, better nutrition, but it also gives opportunities to their children to go up for higher education and create a level of change in the families. The second level that we have in our country is that of small businesses in towns and villages of India. They are another lot that needs to be fostered, nurtured and built. And one would be surprised to know that there are more than 2000 types of artisans in India. Time we begin to tap their potentials build up their skills and their marketing. At the other level, we will have to create high level jobs too, visible both in rural and urban India. But for that, a lot of upgradation in ch and change in attitudes for education, and skill building will need to take place. NASCOM in its survey 
had found that 90% of our graduates and 75% of our engineers are unemployable. That's a sad state. We need to create jobs that fit into the demand area, which are relevant and aligned with the needs of the country. We also need a lot of not only job seekers, but job creators. Just as we had the exodus of people, of migrant laborers going back to the villages, we also can have number of very highly developed people coming back to the roots in rural India. For instance, I'm very happy to see the way the way Mr. Sridhar Vembu in Johor has developed a university for rural youth to be trained in high skilled jobs, which is practical uh, 18 month uh, training that actually gives computers to this youth for the first time, but they're trained so well that by the end of some months, they're able to create and write their own codes. These are the kinds of interventions that we will need we have a great potential. We need to only provide opportunities to our people. Let us all work together to build our India that had a GDP, GDP that was the highest for not till the 1500 CE. Then till 1750, we were with China, India, with having high GDP. And then, of course, in 1900, we dropped down to a very low GDP. But it is not that we cannot rise again. And so, with great hope and optimism for optimal utilization of our skills and livelihood, I wish that we all come out of it and we come out of this recession and do not go into depression at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amadidi, for a very insightful talk. A lot of points of, we have, you know, of, of uh, great significance that we have to move forward and you pointed out. So uh, let's uh, move ahead. Let's move forward to today's topic of social business. Dr. Muhammad Yunus, the pioneer of microfinance and, and the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, has initiated a concept of social business or for-profit social enterprises, an approach that draws on best of both worlds, the nonprofit world with its focus on social impact and for-profit world with its focus on efficiency and effectiveness. Particularly in the current situation with the nonprofits facing substantial financial challenges because of downturn in the economy, the FCRA amendment and so many other reasons. Does this approach offer an alternative business model for NGOs and social entrepreneurs? What are the pitfalls? The next two speakers will discuss this more closely. Our next speaker is Ms. Priya Shah. Ms. Shah is a principal at Yunus Social Business Fund at Bangalore where she leads investments for the fund. Prior to this, she worked in strategy and finance at Simpa Networks, a social enterprise providing asset financing for solar home systems to rural customers via prepaid metering solution. Ms. Shah began her career in capital markets at Bloomberg LP. She holds an MBA from Cambridge University and a BA from Brown University. I'll turn it over to Ms. Priya Shah. Ms. Shah, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Prabhu. And it's an honor and privilege to be here at the STARS Forum, uh, the opening of the day one of the conference. And uh, very pleased to see so many of you uh, here in the audience and signed up for today's uh, conference uh, session. Um, I will be presenting a short presentation. So uh, we'll just share my screen. Great. Um, 
So I wanted to begin um, today's uh, session um, on a brief introduction on the uh, different types of businesses in our economic landscape, uh, just so uh, you have an idea of how the concept of social enterprise or social business actually came about. So on the extreme right hand side, as you can see, is the traditional business. Um, here, this is a pure profit motivated uh, business where the primary driver is to achieve financial value or shareholder value. And um, the, these types of businesses are the ones that we are most familiar with, the large corporations, uh, the financial markets um, and those businesses that have that purpose and that exist in, in all corners of the globe. Uh, on the left hand side, the extreme left hand side, you would have the traditional charity or the NGO. Uh, this type of business is essentially funded by grants, donations, or endowment. This is a purely charitable motive where the, the foundation of the, the, the sort of entity is to, to, to do social good and to address a social problem, but the revenue model is purely uh, from a grant. Uh, so that is a, the sort of the two opposite spectrums. And then as we start moving uh, closer to try to see if we can have a hybrid of these two types of entities, we come up with the concept of social enterprise or social business, which is essentially a combination of a business, a revenue linked, a revenue driven business, which uh, makes profits, but then reinvest those profits back into the business and is fundamentally formulated or, or developed to address a social problem, be it access to finance or uh, hunger or uh, or, or poverty or uh, employment and unemployment. So these are the types of, um, you know, uh, sort of facets of the business that make it uh, a social business. And this is a term that Professor Muhammad Yunus coined, um, you know, from 2006 onwards after he had won the Nobel Peace Prize for microfinance. Moving then into how a, the different features of these businesses work. So as we mentioned earlier, traditional business on the extreme right hand side is the more dominant form of conducting business. As I mentioned, a lot of examples that you would see in today's world. Um, these types of business can scale up rapidly and they're supported by extensive capital markets and growth. On the other hand, traditional charity uh, definitely addresses the pressing challenges in society and provides these inter essential interventions and they are 100% impact focus. And then social enterprises or social businesses basically take the best of both. So they take the, uh, the market-driven solutions um, from the traditional business angle and also the impact and the focus on social good from the traditional charity model. And the focus is on essentially empowering the base of the pyramid population. And India is one of these markets where we have uh, a huge plethora of social enterprises or social business and um, many, many entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs working on the ground tirelessly addressing these kinds of problems and, and really achieving a lot of impact. And I'll come to this later, but as a fund, Unis Social Business Fund Bengaluru has funded uh, seven of these, eight of these uh, enterprises. So we'll go into that detail. Um, later. Uh, this is, as uh, Dr. Prabhu mentioned, uh, Professor Muhammad Yunus, who essentially coined the term social business. Uh, he's best known globally for his work in microfinance. Uh, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006, and he founded Grameen Bank in 1983, beginning a microfinance revolution, uh, which started in Bangladesh and has inspired many, many microfinance organizations across the world, including in, in, in India. He, together with others, uh, co-founded Unis Social Business, which is an organization that seeks to essentially grow the entire purpose of uh, supporting and financing social businesses across the globe. So these are the seven principles of social business that Professor Yunus writes about in his books. Um, and these are the, the, the sort of principles that um, all the social businesses that we uh, fund at Yunus Social Business um, essentially follow. So the first is solves the, the business should solve a social or environmental problem. The business should be financially and economically sustainable in that the services or products that it sells should be able to sustain the operations of the business without any need of external grants or investment. The third is that debt should be repaid to investors, no further profits or returns or dividends, those should be recycled back into the business. The fourth is that the business in, in tune with the third one, the business should reinvest for expansion or seeding other social businesses. 
The fifth is that the business should practice environmental consciousness. The sixth is that uh, the business should ensure that there are market wages being offered as well as better working conditions improved over time. And the seventh is to do it with joy and fulfillment and with purpose. So these are the principles through which uh, social business and the entire uh, you know, sort of intellectual discipline of social business has, has formulated over the last uh, few years. Um, this is an introduction into the Grameen family of organizations. So as mentioned earlier, Professor Muhammad Yunus started Grameen Bank in 1983. And then from there, Grameen actually grew from a microcredit bank into a conglomerate of enterprises dedicated to promoting social and economic development in the poor rural communities of Bangladesh. So each business, um, for example, as you can see, Grameen Shakti, Grameen Seed, and Grameen Telecom, these were all created with a specific intention of solving a human problem and it embodies the first case of the new emerging model of social business. These are all head headquartered in Bangladesh and have really inspired other social businesses with similar disciplines to be founded in other countries. Um, and this essentially uh, inspired uh, also Professor Yunus to start the fund that we now run today as Yunus Social Business. One case study that I wanted to share today was of Grameen Danone. So Grameen Danone is, is a wonderful example of a social business created within a corporation. So this actually is the French company Danone and they were addressing a, a gap in the supply chain and a social need of malnutrition of low income communities in Bangladesh. So they utilized their resources, a large corporate um, with, with to, to actually create uh, you know, the sort of supply chain channels to rural villages in Bangladesh and to actually make sure that the fortified yogurt that they produced actually reached the last mile at affordable prices. So this is an example that has been you know, talked about uh, in multiple case studies, uh, you know, across many academic institutions, etc., and is a very well known one and is, is a great example of how both cooperation and social business can actually work together in harmony. So what do you think is necessary to actually start a social business? And what have we observed in our last few years of operating this fund in India and watching social businesses grow as they come and approach us for support and financing? So we've seen that all the social businesses that we are really proud of in our portfolio, those are the ones that have actually started because they've identified a social problem first. Once they've identified that, that problem, they then develop a business model solution to that problem. After that, they plan on creating a financial strategy, a financial model, financial plan on how they would plan to grow. Then they would start to think about how they would staff their teams, whether it's, it's in management or in the technology side of things or in supply chain or in, um, in investments and, and CapEx and technology. And then they would begin a pilot. So this usually starts either as a small geographic pilot or a pilot on a specific product um, that is as developed by, by a specific technology system and measurement of impact. So this is very crucial to, to developing a social business, to making sure that the populations and the beneficiaries and the, the BOP segment that you're actually serving, how to actually measure the impact of what you do. So for example, in our fund, we look at elements such as breadth, so the number of people that you reach and depth, which is basically the depth, the sort of um, the, in, the percentage of income increase that this, this solution actually uh, helps to engender when, when it's actually carried out um, to the, the poor communities and also poverty focus. So in all of our companies that we have invested in, we look at um, those that are actually serving customers or suppliers that are under $2 a day. And then these social businesses can approach the market to raise funding. These uh, businesses can then grow to scale. The mo most important thing in a social business, which has been underscored by Professor Yunus, is to avoid mission drift. So mission drift is, I, is sort of when you have external partners or stakeholders that come on board and you want you to grow too fast or, you know, in a way that will actually take you away from the actual social mission or the impact objective of the business. And the idea is to make sure you either attract investors or partners that support that social mission, or you, you decide to grow without them. The main objective is always to keep your social mission intact. 
and lastly, to become financially sustainable. So that is one of the, the core goals. And this is not a charity, so there is not supposed to be a dependence on grants or donations. And to keep to make sure that you are keeping a, a net profit, a positive bottom line, so that you're able to sustain all of your costs by the revenues that you're making. So when any of you are thinking about getting started with a social business, these are the kinds of things to think about. What is the social problem that you're addressing? What is the business solution? And when you break that down into four different aspects, a revenue model, how are you actually going to make money for your product or service? How are you going to price it? What are the different types of customer segments that you're going to look at? And then technology input. In today's world, in the post-COVID, post-pandemic era, we are seeing a lot of enterprises that really need to embody or embed technology in their overall uh, operations. And it, it has to be an enabler in order for you to scale. And then what are the impact indicators that you would use um, to measure the impact, the social value of your service to the beneficiaries, customers, or suppliers that you're working with? Um, or thirdly, what is your fundraising plan? Are you looking at debt, equity, or other types of, of different types of funding? And how are you going to integrate that into your overall growth plan? And then lastly, what is the governance framework to make sure that you don't have a mission drift? So you make sure that you have board of directors that are equally aligned in, in all of the mission aspects of what you want to do. So that was sort of the introduction to social business. I'd just like to run through a few slides of, of what Unisocial Business does. We essentially harness uh, the power of social business to end poverty in terms of that's the mission of the social business and we embody that into what we do. We essentially invest in companies uh, with patient financing and we also help with capacity building and portfolio support uh, in terms of strategy, governance, talent support and other uh, types of assistance to our businesses as they grow within our portfolio. We usually invest at the early stage. Um, we're looking at uh, businesses that take debt financing anywhere between one crore to three crores. And we essentially look at all of these aspects when we're evaluating a company for investment. We look at the entrepreneur, the social impact, the track record and the business model, as well as the game changing potential. And our, our, uh, our product is essentially structured as patient debt. And these are the types of social uh, post investment support or capacity building. We have a network globally of Grameen family of organizations across the world. We also have a network of experts in different countries uh, which give access to markets, a very large uh, sort of community, um, as well as you know, very, uh, many, many different types of experts and mentors that we can draw upon and partnerships with universities and uh, other types of uh, academic institutions. And these, this is our portfolio. Uh, we have uh, altogether eight companies. We have companies in microfinance, cash poor microcredit, in early stage uh, primary education, which is Ignis Careers, in waste management, uh, which is Waste Ventures, in education our, or skills training, Virohan Institute, livelihoods, uh, Rangsutra Crafts, of which uh, Sumita Ghost, the managing director, will be speaking uh, later today, and uh, another company in the livelihood space, which is in the e-mobility space, SMV Green. Finally, in the agriculture space, we have invested in S4S Technologies, which works in the dried preservation of vegetables um, in the agriculture supply chain. And finally, a microfinance company called Samhita, which works in access to finance for rural women in Bhopal. So this is um, a brief introduction to social business. Um, thank you very much for your time and looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Priyaji, for that informative presentation and shining light on this alternative model is open, you know, possibilities uh, of other uh, avenues of mutual benefit, both to the investors and the NGOs working in the socioeconomic development space and how uh, you, you network uh, market-driven solutions uh, and bring investors as well, as well as the BOP, the, the bar base of the pyramid people together for larger good. Uh, very good. Let's, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, if there are any questions, we will be, uh, 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 please send it, uh, say, uh, write it in, in the Q&A uh, 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 space, and we will look at it at the, at the, uh, after the next uh, 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 talk. So let's proceed. Uh, now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Uh, Sumita Ghos. Ms. Ghos is the founder and managing director of Rang Sutra, a social enterprise which seeks uh, to bring about socioeconomic development 
and inclusive growth in rural India by engaging both the community and the market. Rangsutra is owned by over 1,000 artisans. Most of them are women. Rangsutra provides design, marketing, technical, and organizational support needed to make crafts. Ms. Ghosh has a master's degree in economics from Mumbai University. She was a Fulbright scholar in the United States, where she completed a master's degree in conflict resolution. She was awarded the Nari Shakti Puraskar by the President of India in 2016. Ms. Sumita Ghosh, I'll turn it over to you. Please take over. Thank you, Dr. Prabhu. And uh, namaste to everyone, all the participants of this um, webinar today. So I'll share my screen. Um, as I speak, I will be making use of the, of the screen so that, um, yeah. Yeah, so Rang Sutra. Um, so Rang Sutra is essentially, we try to be a bridge between rural artisans and global customers. These customers could be in India or anywhere in the country. We also try to be a bridge, a strong bridge between tradition and contemporary, between change and continuity, because we realize that you know any development has to be uh, has to be gradual, has to be uh, should not be disruptive. So hence, this is very core to our belief. Our goal is to ensure sustainable livelihoods for rural artisans based on ethical practices, based on respect for people, the planet, and most importantly, a celebration of India's rich cultural heritage. So prior to starting Rang Sutra for about 15 years, I lived and worked in a remote part of the country um, you know, uh, called Loon Karansar, which is in Rajasthan, Bikaner. It's near the border of Pakistan. And uh, it was, uh, we worked in a, in a um, typical, like a NGO grant, uh, you know, uh, sort of dependent on grants, like the slide that Priya uh, presented earlier. We were at one extreme. And um, after working for several years along in that way, a few of us felt that we needed to look at other options for addressing um, you know, rural issues. So as uh, Dr. Prabhu mentioned, our company is owned not by 1,000 actually, but now by over 2,000 artisans across rural India. We believe that our artisans deserve economic opportunities and we aim to keep alive the tradition of their craftsmanship in a rapidly changing market. We also take steps to, pro, uh, to protect the environment, realizing that you know, um, almost all economic activity, there is a, sometimes a price to pay uh, as you achieve, as you try and accomplish growth, that the, uh, that the environment can be affected adversely. So we are very conscious of that. How do we work? So our artisans, as I said, are also shareholders in the company. And I'll give you a little reason as to how this happened. Initially, we weren't really planning to have artisans as shareholders, yes, as stakeholders and as active members. But very, uh, very frankly, after we started our company, registered our company in 2006 and approached financial institutions for help, no one was willing to give us a loan, even a small loan of, you know, little, as little as we needed four lakhs to start our work. And that's when, uh, you know, we realized that let's give it a shot. Let's go back to the people, you know, who, who want to be part of this and let's see if they can invest uh, their money uh, into this enterprise. Uh, very frankly, I was a bit skeptical initially, but um, you know, having myself, I was not uh, ever, I had never ever invested in any company, never had any money to invest. But surprisingly, uh, all the artisans we spoke to at that time, and we spoke to a thousand of them whom I had the fortune, fortune of working with earlier in Rajasthan, all said yes, and some of them did not have money, so they borrowed it from their self-help groups. 
but uh, the net outcome was that a thousand artisans put in a thousand rupees each and there we got our first equity of 10 lakhs after which I was very, um, you know, uh, concerned and felt very responsible that here are so many people who've put in their faith, who've put in their money. So I also borrowed money and uh, 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 from friends and family and invested another 10 lakhs. And then after that, after that, there were like-minded investors who came in, uh, you know, and one of them being a Unisocial Business Fund, as Priya mentioned earlier. Uh, so, so these are the artisans that we work with, and 80% eight, of them are rural women. Uh, we place a strong emphasis on the community. So if there is a self-help group in the village, we like to work with the self-help group. Where there is no self-help group, we help set up a self-help group uh, you know, with, uh, with people who show initiative. We work with producer groups that are registered or even not registered. And of course, we work with larger registered NGOs who, who have similar goals uh, in, and are working on the ground. So with our work, we essentially do everything from beginning to end. We, um, we provide, we place a lot of emphasis on product development. We give design input, we give trainings, uh, we uh, provide, make available working capital as well if needed to some of our weavers groups. We ensure quality control, and most importantly, uh, we ensure market linkage so that um, you know the work doesn't just stop at giving training. And the way we work is we work both with the B2B model, as they call it. That means we work with large retailers. Uh, like in India, we work with Fab India, and globally, we work with IKEA. And that has really helped us scale up. We also have a small B2C uh, online e-commerce presence now. Uh, we also ensure through our work, we provide opportunity to people, to artisans who want to, even those who may not know a traditional skill, but who want to work, we, we uh, ensure that they get this opportunity and provide the training. We provide safe, secure workspaces for artisans in their village or in a close by town. We ensure fair practices. And uh, for our buyers, we also are dependable because that's very important that if you, have a, if you have an order and you don't fulfill it on time, then the next time you're not going to get the order. And last and not the least, environment responsibility. So we use a lot of cotton in our products. So we are part of the Better Cotton Initiative. We've set up effluent treatment plants wherever uh, we do dyeing of yarn or fabric. And most recently, we have also started uh, working with solar powered looms. So uh, what we have done is when we started work, all the artisans we worked with were all working out of, our, of their homes. So it was very difficult to monitor the work. So we've set up what we call Rang Sutra Kala Kendras or craft centers. And these centers are places where artisans are trained. Uh, and they initially, we had to motivate them to come to these centers because many of the women didn't want to get out of their homes. But after, uh, after the initial hesitation, now they are very, very keen to come to work to the centers. Uh, then of course, we provide training workshops for our craft managers. I'll talk a little bit about our craft managers. These are artisans in the village who show, uh, you know, who've shown leadership and who, skills and uh, they, they are able to motivate others. So we work with them closely to enable their leadership and also give them skills in management uh, to sort of record people's work and monitor quality, et cetera. So that's how uh, we ensure that uh, you know, resources and abilities, capabilities are built on the ground rather than people going in the traditional way, like for example, in the, in the garment industry or textile industry, you have quality techers who will come in from the towns or the cities and who will come in, in, into your unit and reject pieces and go away. And, you know, so you're stuck with all that. So to avoid all that, we, we've uh, enabled people on the ground to, to pick up these skills. So these are our centers where, um, where people can come in and uh, you know, learn and grow and connect with each other, as well as, of course, earn. 
while they're doing this. So 80% of Rang Sutra's workers are women. And this, this work has given women independence and autonomy. Women now invest their income in their children. They're, most importantly, they're sending daughters to school, which in some cases earlier, they were not doing that, especially in Rajasthan. Uh, women artisans have become group leaders and they have agency in their homes and in their villages, motivating other women to follow in their footsteps. The opportunities we provide women to improve their craft, supplement their incomes and participate actively in our supply chain, help them gain, uh, you know, uh, sort of a lot of uh, uh, independence and take ownership of their work and of their lives. So these are some of the women we work with. And uh, I think this is the, the most, uh, you know, although it is non-tangible things like independence, empowerment, respect, but they matter a lot to us and to the artisans. So it's not just about earning cash income, it's about all these other things as well. And, um, you know, as, um, as Priya mentioned in her, uh, in her presentation earlier, you have to find one thing to focus on because all of us who worked in rural India know that there are many, many, many problems from health and education, drinking water. So for us, what we decided is we'll focus on economic empowerment and work creating work because we feel that this, this can be a, a source for true empowerment. So currently we work in several, uh, you know, six different states of the country. Rajasthan is where we work the most in the states of, Bik in the districts of Bikaner, Barmer, Jaisalmer, Jodhpur, Sanchor, and Churu. In Uttar Pradesh, we work in Mirzapur, Gyanpur, and Hardoi. Jammu and Kashmir, we work in Srinagar and in a district called Bandipura. Manipur, we work in Imphal. Uh, Maharashtra, we work in a place called Ambavane near Pune. And uh, most recently, we've started working in Madhya Pradesh in a district called, ba in a, uh, called Dhar, a block called Bagh, where they do beautiful uh, Bagh prints. And we have an office in Delhi where I am based and a small team. So what have been the learnings of our work? What have been the takeaways? Uh, one of the things we found is that I found that, you know, it doesn't matter, you, you know, a single step goes a long way. You can find one person. For example, when we started working in Uttar Pradesh, I did not know a single person in those districts of Mirzapur and Gyanpur. But finding one person who showed enthusiasm, then another, then another, and then they themselves. So, you know, the power of individual cannot be undermined. And of course, the power of groups, however small or big, Second most important uh, is the power of partnerships and collaborations. And we've especially experienced this in this post uh, COVID where our partnerships with our buyers, with our artisans, with our funders, bankers, all have you know, supported us so much so that we have been able to continue our work, maybe at a slower pace, but definitely managed to continue our work and enable you know, artisans uh, to earn the incomes. We also, the other thing is that, you know, really uh, recognize the value of rural traditions and knowledge and build on these because as Shama Didi said earlier, you know, our rural uh, India is full of so much of knowledge that can be built upon. Um, then we feel that of course, you know, work is worship in a way, remunerative work for adults is best for human development. Secondly, handwork, any kind of handwork is, is therapeutic and has helped many, including in this pandemic, you know, being busy, uh, working with one's hands, keeps one's mind focused and calm, apart from, of course, earning an income. Uh, for sustainability, be market-oriented, but not market-driven. And here I'll repeat what Priya said earlier that, you know, we need to be, we are not like the traditional business. So we are not going to be driven by the market, but we have to be market oriented for, in order to be sustainable. And of course, most important risk people and the environment. And going ahead, we feel that, you know, participatory rural development and rural of rural community, empowerment of rural communities should be the focus of the country's work because that's where, that's where the, the work is, the life is, and we can grow as a country. 
Thank you so much. I think that's, uh, I come to the end of my presentation. Ha happy to take any questions whenever, whoever has them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sumita ji, very much. Rang Sutra really embodies not just a concept, but it is not a, some idea, but it embodies a successful example of this concept in practical action, in operation. And you brought it down to the field level as to how it really works. So we're really glad that uh, now we are going to thank you so much. And then we'll move on to our questions. And uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, type it in the Q&A and we'll start with that right now. Okay. Now, uh, you know, uh, and this is it, it, uh, to uh, me Priyaji uh, this, or, or uh, Sumita ji, anyone could. What is the time uh, line, so to speak, from an idea to return funds to the investors? Once the investors make this thing in social enterprise, uh, social business, what do you, you know, what is the time fact, uh, lag between giving investment and start getting some return out of it? Sure. Um, Sumita, you can go ahead. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, at Rang Sutra, we were, we were, uh, in a way, we were fortunate. We had a strong partnership with, uh, you know, an organization like um, Fab India in the beginning. So in the initial years, of course, uh, you know, when all the artisans put in money and uh, first year, we were not profitable. Second year, we sort of broke even. Third year, we were profitable. We were lucky in a sense. And we could demonstrate the power of our model and we were able to give back uh, dividends to our artisan shareholders. And that really gave a confidence to many more to, to uh, become part of it. Although our purpose never really was to give back dividends and the artisans themselves are not in it for the dividends because they're very small. Their main purpose is that, um, you know, they get regular work, but giving the, you know, getting, being able to uh, give dividends showed sort of, uh, you know, test of the, of the model. And that was, so over the years we've been, some years we've been profitable, some years we've broken even, couple of years we've been at a loss. But um, I, I, we, I would say between anything, you know, between four years to a longer time, actually, we like our investors to be invested in us for long term. That's what our, uh, you know, that's what we, we expect. Okay. You know, um, how is the technology for the various activities sourced? Is it developed in-house or is it outsourced? You know, uh, uh, how do you go? Go about because not everybody who's starting this, particularly in rural areas, have all this, you know, know-how, and it, it requires so many other, uh, so many wheels turning at the same time to be successful as any enterprise. So, how do you get the knowledge base that the for-profits have, and transfer it into, uh, you know, these uh, uh, the other side of it, the social enterprise part of it? Yeah, that's a very um, important question, actually. The good thing about uh, the field that we work in, which is traditional crafts, is that people already have the skill. Most people that we work with already had it. Some we have trained. And um, also the good thing is that like we, we work with a lot of women who do embroidery or knitting or patchwork, and you don't need much infrastructure for that. You just need your fabric, you need your needle, Yes, we, do, we did need equipment for, uh, say, sewing machines. Sewing machines when we wanted to finish the product. Then one thing we realized as we moved from, you know, as we scaled up a bit, that we really needed to, um, to, uh, to uh, you know, sort of imbibe some of the practices that our larger competitors uh, were, were good at. Like, for example, earlier, each of our tailors would cut and sew one, you know, kurta separately. So we, we decided that no, in order to get good quality and standardized, uh, standardization, we need to centralize certain operations. So we got a central, what is called a layer cutting table, a layer cutting machine so that, so that it's A, it's faster. Secondly, it's also um, uh, more standardized, standardized because if one person is cutting, 
uh, and another person is cutting, then the, your medium size may differ by an inch or so. So, of course, we had to train our tailors to operate these machines, the layer cutting machines, but we did that. So that then setting up of an, uh, you know, as we grew, we also um, invested a little bit in, in a dyeing unit, a small dyeing unit, yarn dyeing unit, and an effluent treatment plant. Later on, we invested in solar powered looms because some fabric we realized didn't need any extra design. So we could just, uh, you know, investing in those looms was worth it. So yes, a combination of some of the, and most importantly, using also now digital technology. Uh, one of the things that I've learned, because I'm, I don't come from a business background, uh, although I've studied economics, is that, you know, how much inventory you hold is key to your business. And monitoring this in inventory, keeping track of the stock you have, your raw material, your work in progress, your finished goods, it shouldn't be too little, it shouldn't be too much. So monitoring this and having a good software uh, to monitor all this is, is very, very important. Yes. Now, what about distribution, marketing, you know, or transportation? Those are, you know, those is, how do you, imbibe those uh, that 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 seems to be the most difficult part competing with established businesses for profit businesses is very hard because they already have the market set up the distribution thing set up how do you price it and you know uh, uh, compete with them and be successful yeah i must admit it was a challenge when we started um, and uh, especially because we are so dispersed and so our you know, transport costs were high, uh, higher than someone who has a unit, say, in a place like Gurgaon or Bombay. But uh, we had some advantages. For example, our rural village centers, there were no rents. It was we were functioning out of a community development building or we were functioning out of a place where which had a very minimal rent. You know, that's the advantage when you're in a, when you're operating out of villages compared to the rent, say someone would place for a, pay for a unit in, in Gurgaon or Delhi. But uh, yes, that was one of the things. Then secondly, of course, um, you know what, so, so that was one of the challenges we faced. How does one balance, um, you know, social goals and economic goals? So there was a pre pressure on us to sort of, you know, compete and you had to, uh, you know, with price. But we were very, we were very clear that, look, what goes to the artisan should be at least a minimum and fair wage. We would not compromise on that. Yes, sometimes we would compromise on our margins, the, um, the organization's margins. We would compromise on that sometimes. And in, when it didn't work, either way, we would say no to the order. So it's, we, we, it took us a while, but then we were able to demonstrate that you know, our products were different from machine-made products. So uh, it was a well worth fought battle. Subhita ji, there are a couple of questions for you, if I may. Uh, one is, uh, because you have so many artisans, there are 2000, 2000 plus and, and all over the place, how do you ensure uniformity and quality? That's number one. And the other question also pertains to you, what is the difference between market uh, driven and um, um, you know the, what's the other word you used? A market, uh, let's see. Uh, you said mar not market driven, but market, you know. Uh, yeah, market oriented. Oriented. Market -oriented. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'll take your first question. You know, as uh, Shamadidi said earlier, you know, one size doesn't fit all. We are a different country. So what worked in Bikaner need not work in Varanasi and certainly may not work in Jammu and Kashmir. But one thing we realized is that, and this is something that I personally am very interested in, whenever we start in a new place, we identify that one or two people who we feel can, you know, embody the spirit of Rang Sutra. And then, uh, you know, uh, no one has to have a degree in marketing or business or design to be able to do this work. With regular continuous trainings on the ground, on the job, we are able to ensure that, you know, the basic quality uh, that's required by the customers and, and you know, our basic norms of working are all adhered to. Uh, so that's the first uh, 
question, answer to that. And the second one, what is the difference between market driven? So, um, you know, I think Priya alluded to this earlier in her presentation. Uh, normal, normal businesses, we find that, you know, they take in investment first and then uh, from an angel investor or their own resources. And then when they want to scale up, they go in for mainstream financing. And the mainstream financing, what happens is that uh, several investors are uh, mainstream investors in the past, at least, and I'm sure even now, uh, are often just focused on return, return on investment. So they will tell you to scale up quickly to, you know, to, okay, uh, to supply. Like there was a lot of, you know, um, sort of suggestions that there could be that we, we supply to what is called fast fashion, you know, fast fashion. Now we were very clear that, you know, our handwork and fast fashion just did not match. We could not provide those cheap, um, you know, qual uh, garments that are stitched in a factory in a city um, uh, you know, with our work where there is so much time taken in handloom weaving or in hand embroidery. So we decided that we will not be, uh, we will not go there. We will take our time, but we will partner with people who, who have the same, uh, you know, somewhere there is an alignment of values. And I say that, but we have to be market oriented because if our products don't sell, how are we going to continue? We are not a model that is based on grants. So we have to sell our products. So they have to be relevant in the market. And the good thing is that even, uh, you know, recently, especially after the COVID, our e-commerce, which was very small, it was very small, has picked up. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to, uh, to share that there are so many uh, people, and especially younger people, who, who are under, in India, who are understanding the value of handwork, of you know, want to know the story of how the products are made, who's the one who made it, did she get a fair deal, does she have good? So I think that's, that's good for our future of uh, hand, rural handicrafts. So that's actually, a, you are touching on a question which came in. What is a fair wage? I mean, what, what does an artisan ex can expect to earn in a, in a month, so to speak? What is the minimum? Do you give any minimum wage? How do you, how do you compensate them? Yeah, so this is a difficult, uh, you know, it's a difficult question in the sense our artisans are not full-time workers with us. Uh, they get earnings on, they work, they get piece rate work. Uh, because, uh, and in the beginning when we started work, an average artisan had sort of work off and on and would earn just say 500 rupees from some work that she got, you know, a, a few little bit of work. But once we got established, the incomes have gone up to as much as anything between like 6,000 rupees for part-time work, few hours, to as much as as high as 15,000 for full-time work. So typically in a rural, in a village, uh, since a lot of women, and it's not just rural women, all of us, uh, you know, have a lot of other work. We have to do housework, take care of uh, families and some of the rural women also have cattle or you know small uh, animal and have to fetch water so it depends some of them can give like three hours a day to this work some of them can give six hours a day so whenever we are uh, whenever we are designing something new sampling something new we calculate the time that it's taking to make that piece to embroider that garment we look at the minimum wage that is be given by the state, that has been given by the state government for that uh, you know, particular craft. And our artisans come under the semi-skilled or highly skilled. Uh, so it varies from state to state. And we ensure that the artisans earn at least that much, if not more. And initially it was a challenge, but over the years, as their skills have also picked up, we're very happy to say that we are easily able to, you know, uh, pay over the minimum wage of each state. Uh, Shamati, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you run a very large uh, institution, uh, spread on ISO. And given the experience of the COVID situation and the other thing, the fault lines that you brought to bear in your presentation, what changes or in perspective or in, in, in action, have you decided at CORD to move forward 
to try to correct it in 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 which on the ground so to speak any changes you are contemplating or have you already instituted to correct those fault lines that we, became so obvious in the last 10 months or so and i mean are likely to stay in the covid post covid period see uh, what we did in the very beginning of the lock at the beginning of the lockdown was to make uh, our government in the state government to understand that the panchayats are all over the country they are constitutionally recognized and if you are going to ignore them during the covid time you are not bringing people to the center of the whole covid problems and resolving those problems so that was one step that we have already worked with panchayat raj institutions we made the government take it up as a state uh, uh, initiative and uh, maybe there were many other ngos that might have been saying but it became one thing that panchayats had to come into the center of the stage once they were in the center of stage what happened was that her, looking at quarantine the health problems and the economic of scale for the people in the villages uh, because they are small farmers and marginalized farmers so their problems of reaching out to the market was not much uh, we could meet all of them at all our sites uh, and the containment of the transmission of the disease was very high in the areas that we got them involved people involved uh in fact uh, i would i am very proud of the fact that all the mahila mandals all over the country that we are working about more than 30 40000 women in the very beginning of the covid 19 they said we will not allow anyone to go hungry and not hungry in the sense of in the beginning because they sort of donated their whatever little um, over surplus they had and plus what the community based organizations did was make sure that there was livelihood for everyone even for disabled persons and how to promote it they were in constant contact so that's why i said i'm very optimistic when we try to bring the people in the center of the stage the other steps that we as cord are going to take in a more uh, uh, way is of course we have the pharma producing company and the gurudhara one something like dange sutra uh, but we want to now focus more on the youth the youth are really uh, got many ideas uh, i saw that uh, some of the uh, ones that who are doing carpentry plumbing welding uh you know machinery work everything they form small whatsapp groups as a result as a group of three or four of them they become became entrepreneurs in the area as soon as construction started so they have uh we just need to build up their um upgrade their skills and then for those who want to go into services we going to take up other uh, enterprises i'm looking at developing more youth as small uh, job providers by self employment so that is the kind of change and i think it's possible because uh, uh we've done a lot of digital training now and people are so the, the rural india is really very quick at picking up things uh today 30 to 40% of rural india does have smartphones so uh, and the others are picking it up because of the education that the children had to have education so those are the changes but i'm very sad about education in india and the government school as is happening now in the covid time especially for people with disabilities uh so there are many changes that we have to really look into we are working with the government and with the social welfare department and the education department asking them questions so we sort of go over it so i am going to uh, turn to uh, uh, priya ji uh, priya ji uh, these uh, when you start branches in different parts of the country how are they registered how is the social enterprise is it a company a company trust how you know what is the legal structure of that because it looks like all the artisans other people who work for you are private 
contractors, you pay them, they're not employed and so on and so forth. So what, how does that work? Where, what space does that belong to the social enterprise itself? Sure, thank you for this question. Uh, so on a vast majority of companies that we've seen coming to us for funding, usually the social enterprises are listed as private limited companies. So they uh, you know, are very similar to our, your regular MSMEs or SMEs, and they are essentially private. So all of their documentation, their financials, et cetera, would be listed on the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. However, we have also funded uh, companies that are different types of structures. So for example, Rang Sutra is a very interesting company that we have uh, provided debt financing to, which used to be a producer company, and now it's an unlisted public company. So that is also in its own, uh, you know, by majority of, of their artisan shareholders. So that can also be classified as a social business, of course. Um, in addition to that, a trust or a Section 8 company can also be classified as a social business. So there is no, uh, you know, hard and fast rule on the, the sort of regulated type of structure, I would say that, you know, as long as it is a social mission, it meets, uh, you know, those uh, basic social impact objectives. And also it has a, a financial model or revenue model through which it earns, uh, you know, the key revenues for the various different uh, channels, customer channels, etc., which is not financed by grant funding, but rather by the way that the business actually generates, uh, you know, the uh, revenue for their products or services. That is actually the, the core importance of, of how those uh, social businesses are structured. You know, there are several listings that if they, if the, of the uh, attendees, uh, they want more information. If they want to start on their own, you know, uh, these part, this part of, how can they contact you? How can you guide them uh, in that? Because, you know, uh, because there, now there is idea, but they want to put into fruition, into practice. There are a lot of steps to go through that. How does one truly, you know, take that idea and put it to fruition and, and go through logical steps? Is there a handholding from your institution? Does it have to be a part of the units in you know, a, a branch of, or can you just advise them in consultancy, whatever? How does would that work? Sure, absolutely. And that's a great question. Um, and we're always looking to inspire, you know, the young social businesses of tomorrow. So yeah, inspire in, a lot of um, people. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's super kind. It's mostly Professor Yunus who has, has done so. Uh, but yes, we um, essentially as a debt fund, uh, we don't have an acceleration or cohort, you know, that actually guides early stage companies through the whole concept of starting a business, the revenue model, uh, you know, planning out who your customers would be, etc. However, in India, there's many, many social incubators or social impact accelerator programs that these young companies can sign up for. So as soon as they have an idea and they're looking on how to scale it, I would really advise them to look at various different accelerators in the ecosystem that exist where you have to make an application and apply. And actually that gets you, even doing the application gets you into the frame of mind of thinking, this is how I structure my business. These are the different verticals. This is my sort of financial plan for the next three years. These are my customers. These are my stakeholders. This is my BOP impact. And in addition to that, there's various different uh, resources online. So there's courses that you can take on platforms such as Coursera and many others. Um, a lot of social impact funds have actually uh, started these virtual online training programs or virtual and online courses, which open you, open you up in terms of mind to the whole academic discipline of social business. And there's various different case studies that have been written. Um, so as I mentioned, Grameen Danone is a case study. I think Rang Sutra also has a case study. And so I would, I would urge the enthusiasts who would like to create their own social business to, to read as much as possible, to sign up for these accelerator cohort programs, to sign up for virtual, uh, virtual you know, courses, academic courses, and also to enlarge your network. So the more people you talk to, the more webinars such as these that you attend, uh, the more uh, sort of net, uh, ecosystem connections that you make, the further that you wouldn't get in, in your entire endeavor to be a social business. You know, uh, you have several, you know, you have evolved so many other agriculture, crafts, so and so forth, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. in your uh, UNIS uh, business model. Now, these models, are they tested out initially uh, to make sure that, that, that they, how, how did they evolve? Was it very clear to start with? Is there something that you learn along the way? And when do they become, uh, you know, when do you put it into practice? It's okay, now it's 
is, is ready for prime time, so to speak. Is there a research that you do on the side? I mean, how does that all work? Or is it research on, on, on the job, so to speak? So how is it, how does an idea mature? Sure. Um, so that's also a great question. I mean, with the businesses that we have financed, they've usually been, uh, I would say, three to five years of age. Uh, Rang Sutra is actually uh, an exception case. Um, but most of the businesses that we've looked at have, we don't actually invest in pilot stages. We urge the social entrepreneurs that we work with to have actually tested out the business. Now, what does that mean? What does a pilot really mean? So it means that when you have an idea or a concept, you focus on a particular geographic area or a segment so for example for uh, one of our um, you know education or skilling companies uh, which is headquartered in delhi they started their organization just focusing on skilling the low income youth in and around delhi ncr on healthcare training so they were training them to be basically paramedics in hospitals and uh, and clinics etc so they started out with a basic training program and then as they saw the traction building up from these students more more people signing up, um, you know, more feedback being generated, then they started actually building on this revenue model, then they approached um, NSTC, they approached, uh, you know, the, the sort of CSR mandates of, um, of Tata and, and others, and then they started approaching funders like Unisocial Business. So it starts small, it starts with a sort of um, sample size of a, a few key customers or a few key stakeholders, and then you can kind of build up from there and prove your model. So basically proof of concept is when you start actually getting paid for the services or the product that you're trying to sell as a social business. And then Others can actually see the, the sort of fruit of your labor when they actually start recognizing it. And then you formalize that. You create a, you know, a financial plan, which actually shows your uh, you know, costs, expenses, your growth strategy, actually growing your revenues, et cetera. And then you can attract further funding. So that's, that's sort of how I have seen businesses in our portfolio and others that we have observed growing. You know, uh, if somebody wants to invest in social enterprise, but they don't want the return. Whatever return comes, they want to put it back into the fund itself to make it like a perpetual fund. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Can, can that be set up? Yes, that. You know, yes, like that is not very possible. I mean, there is very... you know, reinvesting the dividends for more shares, so to speak, that in a in a rather market. But instead of the market, our market is social enterprise. So can that? perpetuity go on, can that be set up? Do we have that set up already? Yes, um, so I would say we do, and that's the whole principle of how Unisocial Business Fund has been developed in accordance with Professor Yunus's uh, uh, social business principle. So our fund itself, we are a debt investor. When we invest, say, one crore, two crore into a social business, we um, we sort of uh, wait until that principal amount is is sort of recycled back into our fund, and then we again on lend it to a different entity, creating more impact through that entity. The uh, whatever is the interest that we gain from that uh, sort of um, the loan instrument, we then spend that on on maintaining our own costs and you know operational expenditures within our fund. So that's the example on the debt side. Even in the equity side, there have been funds that have been created uh, both both in India and abroad that basically do the recycling of, of, of their principal amounts or their profits. And that so can, every dollar gets, money. yes, every what dollar gets reinvested. Money. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Now, you know, uh, I think we are going to stop here because we want to start winding down. Any questions we are not reached, they will be answered. And they, you know, they will uh, by email uh, at the end of the meeting and we'll post it also on the YouTube, uh, all these questions will be posted on the YouTube so everybody could see it too. But a lot of, there are sort of specific questions that they want to, uh, I will just tell the attendees that you can reach them because you can go on the websites or the, uh, uh, the program has a website, a UNOS uh, business model uh, and Ranga Sutra. And the, the, you know, uh, Priyaji's uh, uh, contact uh, information is there, Sumitaji is there. If you have anything for Shamadi, you can do calls. And the, you know you can directly contact because there are some very specific questions in the sense you know can we add you know organic how do you do organic farming we want some extra help from chemical to organic or can we do extra arts not just you know knitting could we do so they are very specific and then that can be tackled that way but so please 
it is okay for them to contact you uh, uh, later on if or with specific questions would that be okay yes good yes okay. absolutely all right so i think let's move on uh, i think we have you know uh, uh, let's go ahead and uh, summarize uh, some uh, we had a wonderful presentations today um uh, uh really uh, uh, very insightful uh, perspective of uh, the current situation how uh, the covid has really disrupted uh, the life normal life and also brought to bear uh, uh, brought into light the fault lines uh, its impact on my particularly migrant workers uh, disabled the rural poor and uh, uh, the role of the farmers the agriculture to hold the society together during this hard time uh, was also highlighted and uh, she stressed that this is going to be a tough problem nobody has easy solutions but a multi-pronged approach but the principles of uh, uh, you know aligning job creation with with needs of the person the development needs to be people centered development needs to be around the people and not people around the development and there will have to be a change in attitude in education in skills building and so uh, 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 she is already taking the steps for core and i hope through her connection and our, all of us uh, through the policy also with the government that new vision new this thing how we can uh, 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 design our way forward or, or plan our way forward uh, we we are very uh, priya mrs priya shah mrs priya shah was, was, was it was very enlightening the hybrid model of market driven solutions for social development while empowering the base of the pyramid the bop so really combining both the best best of both worlds the for profit only as opposed to social enterprise or charitable institutions and she gave us her own principles and keeping social mission front and center in everything you do i think that's what i got would be the right the motivation the intention uh, um, of a social enterprise keeping that always never forgetting that and uh, sumita ji gave so many examples of how this works in action and uh, it is so good to see uh, more than 2000 artisans how have been brought and have been linked uh, with the market market oriented but not market driven and we got the got a wonderful message and uh, i think this opened a lot of doors and a lot of possibilities so uh, i think uh, thank you shama didi shang thank you priya ji thank you sumita ji for the instructive very instructive session thank you all the attendees uh, i would like to remind everyone that tomorrow dr pramod khadilkar visiting professor at iit delhi and bharat inclusion research fellow will be conducting a workshop on design thinking for building better products and services it will be a very illuminating session that you don't want to miss thank you all for attending we look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow at 6 pm indian time so there are other people internationally stay safe namaste